All right, for the interest of time, I'll get started. Um, just because I know we have a lot of things that we want to talk about and have been already talking about and want to share now with everybody here. So um, thanks again, and I'll get started. My name is Lexi Johnson, and I'm the curator at the One Archives at the USC Libraries. I'm delighted to have bees joining me for the third in a series of conversation as part of the Safer at Home exhibition. For the exhibition, which I've been curating in real time, I've been selecting items from the One Archives collection that resonate with and reflect on the idea of safer at home. While the exhibition began as a way to reflect on the ordinance issued as a response to the coronavirus pandemic, it now applies equally to the protests in response to bullies' brutality. They are, of course, inseparable. COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting marginalized, oh, disproportionately affecting, excuse me, marginalized individuals. Police are killing black and brown and trans individuals. Thus, I want to probe what safer at home means in a world shaped by structural racism, classism, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia. Whose safety? Whose home? As defined by whom? Using archival material as a lens, this project will continue to pose questions and challenge ideas about space, place, and activity in relationship to safety and freedom. These archival materials act as a mirror, bringing the past into the present and offering perspective on what is happening today. They highlight people, events, and activities from the past, but offer inspiration and comfort, as well as challenge in the present. To complement these archival selections, I thought it was essential to include the voices of queer of color contemporary LA-based artists in the project. I've invited four artists to participate and their work is available online in the exhibition. In addition to today's conversation, I am also planning an in-person exhibition of all of these materials when it is safe to do so. I wanted to do something generative now, but also offer the opportunity to see these items in person as both something to look forward to and a way to continue this conversation. Before I introduce Bees and we dive into today's conversation, I just wanna make a few housekeeping remarks. Um, the conversation is meant to be about 30 minutes. We'll discuss their work, thoughts, and reflections on the current moment. There might be time for a few questions, so I encourage you to post anything you might have in the Q&A box below. And if we don't get to them, we'll have another opportunity to answer them, maybe offline in social media, et cetera. The conversation is also being recorded and will be made available for viewing later online in the exhibition website. And now as a way to begin, just a bit about bees. Brenda Zhang is an interdisciplinary visual artist and architectural designer who makes paintings, sculptures, installations, and architecture, and is based on Tongva land, Los Angeles. In their practice, they're interested in sincerity as armor, physical and cultural construction as entangled processes, and the ongoing practice of translation as a deep inquiry into how power and narrative shape one another. As a queer femme Chinese diasporic artist, they construct new narratives through intentional misreading, misalignment, hiding in plain sight, and an extreme attachment to certain objects. Bees is a founding member of Space Industries, a spatial design collective based in San Francisco, Bay Area, and Los Angeles. Currently, they are architectural assistant to Lauren Bonn at the Metabolic Studio, as well as a participating artist in Gray Area's Foundation 2019-2020 Experiential Space Research Lab. They hold a Master of Architecture from the University of California, Berkeley, and a Bachelor of Arts with Honors in Visual Arts from Brown University. Thank you so much, Bees, for agreeing to be part of this conversation and project today, and I can't wait to talk with you about your art and practice. And I'm going to share a slideshow so that I can share some of the images while we talk, and I'll kind of tune into the ones that are most relevant for our conversation. So. Awesome. Thank you, Lexi, and thank you and the whole team at One Archives for holding this space. Um, I did want to start with by dropping a few links actually into the chat. Very fun. Um, just a, a resource, nativeland.ca, that has been helpful for me in the past to identify whose land I'm on and I'm occupying. Um, and secondly, to drop another link into the chat box that goes to the organizing website for All Black Lives Matter LA. Um, and to, to just comment that on this moment today, it's Monday and yesterday, like 25,000 people were out in the streets um, in Los Angeles. 
um, lifting up black trans people and black queer people and, and, and in a resounding way saying that all black lives matter and, and to decenter the conversation from only one type of black person who's being um, systemically uh, ex systemically experiencing violence from the state and a racist system. Uh, so I wanted to put both of those things up as well as a collective that I'm starting to learn more about right now um, and uh, called Black Trans Femmes in the Arts um, and uh, to whom I will be donating the payment for my session today. Thanks. Thanks so much, B. I think that's really important. And we were just saying like, what a time to be working on this project in real time and what a weekend we've had with um, the huge turnout of protests from LA, New York, all over, as well as the Supreme Court decision this morning. So it's, it's quite the time. And um, I thought maybe as a way be to begin, we could just th think about um, kind of our conversation before this about going ahead with the program and why we're doing the work and what this kind of work means to us um, and how it's so important to be having these conversations at a time um, where we're really fighting kind of civil rights um, battle that has been ongoing, but is reaching a climax um, to which at least we haven't really seen in our lives yet. Um, but as a historian are interested to um, track this progress over time. Definitely. And um, to step back, to get half step back, I think one of the things that I've been thinking about individually and systemically and like in my personal practice and in my workplace with my coworkers and colleagues is, um, you know, striking that balance between um, centering and uplifting black people, black communities, black leadership, black uh, movements, um, and then also finding all the ways that as non-black and white people, we can be speaking out and speaking up and calling in and, and doing all the work that um, we should be leveraging our racial privilege towards doing. And so to that end, Lexi and I, I really appreciated a dialogue that the two of us had um, in the last two weeks where as soon as um, the momentum was building, uh, we were able to connect and, and, and talk about what made sense for this conversation that had been scheduled before. And ultimately coming to a place of saying, okay, let's hold the space because there's all of these institutional quagmires <laughs> um, that, that, uh, that Lexi was very thoughtful to explain to me. Um, but, you know, but talking about, okay, but you know, this payment can, can go somewhere else. And there are, there are topics that we can discuss and, and, to, and truly there are uh, a ways of like working through um, anti-racist practice that can potentially thoughtfully be modeled um, by non-black folks uh, with, with ourselves, with each other, and, 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 and ultimately like take some of that burden off of the folks who are experiencing um, the most disproportionate and, and magnified oppression. I mean, that super well said that really sums up the kind of conversation that we've been having. But as I just reiterate from the introduction I said is um, safer at home became this interesting phrase as soon as it came out to me. Um, and its rhetoric has only kind of the interest around its rhetoric has only intent intensified in the present moment because thinking about what does home mean and what is home not just you know the place maybe where you sleep but also the city in which you live the nation in which you are a part and what does safety mean or for whom is it safe and not safe and how do we make a home be that the city the nation the country your immediate neighborhood that is actually safe for everyone. And um, so I wanted to continue doing that work um, with artists and talking in a real time as well as sharing their art because to me, the visual art, the conversations, the archive are all part of this fight and we need to bring all of those forth and keep doing the work in the ways that we can while continuing to learn to be more anti-racist, to learn and read every day more about what we don't know and recognizing those gaps and listening to those who do know while also continuing to do that work. So that's what we're hoping, I think, to do today and really in this project as a whole, as it takes on many forms from an online exhibition to Zoom conversations to at some point in the future, a kind of space that we can make and hold together um, when it is safe to do so back at the archive. So maybe that's a good segue just to get into these a little bit about your work, the work, uh, the design work, the painting work, your practice, your activism kind of explaining all that you're working on right now. Um, and I can kind of move the slideshow as you talk through maybe uh, go in a kind of overview. So 
so people know. Definitely. Yeah. So um, I love the word work because there's, you know, the work that we all need to do. And I, for when I say it that way, it's sort of like this, the movement work, the, the personal life work, you know, the driving work. There's like the work, quote unquote, that we get paid to do, or, you know, maybe we would like to get paid to do um, and or do so we can do the other work and there's there's artworks or works you know works that are objects and surfaces and and spaces and um so i love that word um and um to tie back into or to talk a little bit about my practice but tying into the safer at home question as well because i was saying to lexi before we came on that the yeah it's only become richer as lexi you were saying as well of, of a set of questions because of how um how much all of this struggle has been ongoing and, and it's only we're seeing a moment where a lot of different aspects of it and experiences of it are being compounded. So in my statement and my bio, I, I talk about like being um, fascinated by how um, physical and construction and cultural construction are entangled processes. And I kind of use that language in my architectural training because I think about like the process of construction, constructing an object, constructing a building, constructing a city, and then the cultural construction, um, the way that culture is socially created and, and kind of like agreed upon, um, but can be changed. And those things are um, entangled. So like that, the presence of police, the presence of the National Guard is part of the built environment um and safety or home are these like really tenuous um ideas that seem because they've been normalized in a certain way um they seem straightforward like oh i'm going home or like where's your home like where's your home at you know um but actually is really uh contentious and uh and unclear and and i would argue ultimately not a hundred percent useful in the way that we mean it uh which doesn't mean that i don't find home in places um, it's to say that safety often comes at the, co it is not a given, but is a, is a result of others on safety, right? So talking about both, um, the presence of police in, in built environments, but also just like the p police state in overall is, um, at any rate, <laughs> so a lot of that shows up in my painting work, which I'm, I'm thankful you're showing now, um, in that I, think a lot about how um, translating from one medium to another, for instance, so these paintings that are part of a series that I've been working on called Sometimes Forever are actually painted from selfies that, are t that I'm asked soliciting from my, my friends um, and, and some of whom you see up here as well as a self-portrait. The self-portrait I included because I had a conversation with my therapist uh, where she pointed out that I had spent three years painting all of my friends and I had, or under the guise of saying, these are all these people that I love and hold. And she said, you, you've never painted yourself. <laughs> so that's another, that's, that's just a little, little aside, but thinking about the ways that um, translating um, from one medium to another, from like a feeling to a expression, visual expression or, or a gesture um, and ultimately like creating and recreating culture in, in our image, in our images as, as uh, queer people, queer and trans people, as people of color, as, all, you know, a, a, a marginalized communities, as, you know, folks who are just trying to survive and thrive. Um, all of that is uh, one, one way, that's today's way to talk about how the art and design uh, and the activism all come together. <laughs> Well as a start <laughs> yeah just as a way to begin and maybe we could think a little bit or you can expand a little bit about the title sometimes forever um and what that means and kind of thinking about before we went live we were talking a lot about kind of endurance and and durationality and how do we make this fight that we're currently in go the distance basically how do we make it go and keep people involved and active so that strikes with me this kind of idea of sometimes forever and having actual art objects that maybe out, outlive or out exist our own existence. Um, and thinking too about the way in which each of these is named with the, uh, the first name of each individual who's painted. So kind of about, of course, as the historian or archivist, like thinking about naming and objects that maybe kind of exist 
and I'll, yeah. I'll cycle through maybe some of the individual images just so those who are viewing this can see the naming um, as you talk these. Absolutely. And I love that you asked about naming and think about naming. Um, and, and when uh, we had like a little back and forth before and you brought up naming the, the phrase that popped into my head is um, naming is a social contract. So like we have to, we agree on each other's names. We, and it's a really powerful thing to like ask to be, to, to have your name and to speak it and to have it called back to you. Um, and so I think that's like, the, the tender place that I come from with naming and um, and this, the even a, the, the, the subversiveness of playing with names um, is something that I I think you know we can all resonate with folks on this call and watching later you know coming from queer communities coming from them communities coming from communities of color like these are all there's so many experiences of naming and 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 getting named getting our name wrong, um, the, the violence of dead naming, you know, so all of these things that I think um, aren't immediately obvious <laughs> in my work where I'm, I'm, I'm very, I think I'm very like, I'm a very direct uh, visual artist where I'm like, this is a thing, I'm gonna paint the thing and I'm gonna show it to you and we're gonna talk about it, you know, but then the underlying all of that are these um, questions about uh, how to give how to um, understand agency in these contexts. So for instance, like what does it mean to be a portraitist in a way um, asking people in my life uh, to send me a photo of themselves in, with their pose, with their look in their eye, like their expression and their lighting circumstances and, and, and I have to, and then that's it. And then I have to go. Um, it's kind of a setup um that intrigues me and so i keep doing it you know even if and every time it's like giving me more uh interesting things to <laughs> think about um it and um the the only i've said it in a couple of different ways but the only real prompt that i've given these folks is that i'm that i'm interested in in power and agency between the artist the subject and the viewer so like when i was in college i did i did a lot of female nudes you know as a student of Western painting because I, and, and I depicted these female nudes masturbating in the act of self pleasure because I was so curious about like how does the subject of the painter like that, you know, have then some agency like maybe it's when they're not paying attention to what's even happening because they're in an act of self pleasure. And then in this series, then being like, well, what if it's that I don't even get to choose how these books are presenting to to me, um, but then there's a translation that happens and um, that's very transparently like there's there's a thing that I did and there's a thing that they did. For sure. And I think too, it's interesting, obviously we're all doing this now via Zoom. We're all mediated by devices. And so this is a series that is predicated on some of that mediation where the person who you're going to take the por paint the portrait of takes a picture on their phone as a selfie. And then that image gets sent to you and then you paint the image so you kind of replace the cell phone and then us as viewers then become the painter or the cell phone getting the view that the cell phone first got. I mean, I'm not saying that very well, but there's an interesting slippage um, that I think all of us are experiencing maybe now more than ever in real time because we're doing more than ever before on these devices. So that too becomes a kind of interesting aspect. Definitely. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think slippage is the right word for it. And the, the only other thing I will, I want, will like, want to say about this series as well um, in this moment is it also the portraiture also came from um, a lot of my active personal practice of like de-westernizing my art practice so I find myself in dialogue a lot with western painting because I was uh, you know born and grew up in the United States my I'm, uh, my parents were immigrants um, I went to a lot of predominantly white institutions for my schooling and I grew up in New York, live in Los Angeles now, like have, you know, lived in the Midwest, and New England in between and um, elsewhere in Philadelphia, the Mid-Atlantic as well. So I have a lot of love for a lot of places. Um, and the portraiture, <laughs> so like this particular struggle that I'm, I'm wrestling with comes from experiences that I had as an art student where I had a particular moment in which I realized that I didn't know how to paint flesh tones 
of people who are not white. And that, and I was already a college student at that point. And it was this incredibly viscerally upsetting, <laughs> you know, instance as an art student, of course, like not physically harmful, but um, just realizing that I had been taught to mix paint before I'd been taught to use oils. I had been taught to do these things for like 20 years and had not had the experience of painting myself in a way that made sense. I didn't understand the undertones of my flesh. I, and when I asked for help, there were, I had some extremely supportive professors and I had some other professors who were more um, traditional painters who basically um, were dismissive and were saying like, you know, unless you're going to be a hyper realist, you know, or like be in dialogue with that, um, then there's no reason for you to work on figurative work do abstraction, do something else. Like there's so much to paint. And I was like, I want to paint myself and the people in my life who I love. And, you know, and those are predominantly queer people, femme people and people of color. So um, <laughs> that, that, I think that also kind of starts to like show up when you view the collection um, in total, because of course there's like, you know, all sorts of folks represented, but um, I'm always like, sort of like, it's a healing practice in that sense for me to just be like, I'm going to just keep this sometimes forever situation going. And, and saying that name makes you remember the other part of your question, which is, you know, how do we do this for the long game? And I think, you know, um, I, I just said to a friend of mine about this piece that, or the series that I think I'm going to work on sometimes forever, the series, sometimes, comma, forever, <laughs> you know, and, and just like recognizing both the ongoingness and the breaks required. Um, something that come up, Lexi, with you about like, you know, how do artists, you know, how are we both contributing to the work and also to the move, movement for Black lives and Black liberation and liberation for all uh, oppressed peoples? Um, and how do we do that in, in a sustained way? And something I find myself saying, especially to my, um, queer communities and femme communities and communities of color um, is that a lot of us have been socialized to be caretakers, to, you know, not ask for help, to like not, you know, um, to put our, ourselves and our needs aside. And that's a cultural thing across a lot of cultures. And so I've been saying to them, like, I need you and we need you, <laughs> um, you know, and, the, and they'll say it back to me, but just like, I need you to take care. I need you to be well. I need you to be safe you know, um, because, and, you know, I'll, sometimes if I'm joking, I'll even say like, selfishly, you know, I need you to, to be effective and to be your best self and to be um, able to contribute in all the ways that you're really good at and that you want to contribute in. And that's the sustaining, right? It's like to actually be the, the Audre Lorde self-care is like radical, you know, as the revolutionary act is to care for yourself when this when society doesn't care for you. So um, I think there's so much resonance in that in all of these communities that um, that are our audiences through the One Archives. So yeah. For sure, yeah. I mean, how do we sustain ourselves and sustain each other and make that process continual and self-renewing or renewing in that cycle? And two, maybe I was thinking, you know, I think your idea of I'm going to continue this series sometimes forever. It's interesting because it started it well before the pandemic and everything that's happened recently. And that's the same for the, another series, which maybe we can talk about a little bit, all my friends, but thinking and asking about what the relationship you felt like to your work has been since being at home all the time. And maybe in some ways it's not different than before. In other ways, it's very different in terms of the time you have to work on the work, the painting work that is, or um, just having your studio kind of at home for better, or for worse. And I'll just slide ahead to these this series so we can use maybe as a backdrop to talk about some of that. Sure. Um, yeah, this series makes me laugh. <laughs> um, that, yeah. But working it from home and I, I think this, you know, I, 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 I was thinking about this question already, you know, in, in dialogue with you and then, and then I think both of us moving through the last three weeks, um, it's become other questions as well. Like, you know, what has it been like transitioning to work from home? How do you work from home? And also in the movement, how are you contributing to the movement? You know, all of these things. And, um, you know, it goes back to the, like, I need you, I need you all. I'm saying this, everyone watching this, you know, to, to be well and be safe and, and take care. 
so there's that piece and then and then i think um there there's also kind you know a part of that I, that self care radical self care and community care i think is identifying and this has been said so many ways by so many people but where our strengths are and what you know what it does bring us that like meaningful you know that meaning in our lives and and being able to apply that um and so part of working from home <laughs> i'm just there's so many ways to answer this question part of working from home um for me has actually looked like leaning into a particular area that i'm actually very plugged into and feel like i have a lot of leverage points in which is the design and architecture field so you know i did a master of architecture i recently i you know i work as an architectural designer and that you know so i have a network i have an aia or american institute of architects membership so i've been uh, organizing with my uh, collective uh, space industries uh, a document that's been circulating now for a little bit called the anti-racism design resources document and in it is basically to give some idea um, you know centering the the voices the reflections of black designers and architects that have I've put out statements or been interviewed um, in the last three or four weeks. Um, also, like highlighting uh, firms and design practices that are offering pro bono uh, services, whether that's design work, uh, photography of work, or um, or even printing. Um, which I think is like I love that one because it's just saying like if you have a printer, you can contribute to the movement. Um, and as well as, you know, trying to connect uh, student orgs, trying to uplift and elevate like black led organizing efforts. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll call out um, or, or shout out like design is protest, which is led by a bunch of black architects who are gr really great. Ryan Lee Jr. D Nichols, Michael Ford, um, Taylor Holloway and um, architecture is complicit is another uh, developing group that's happening. Um, uh, Vanessa New uh, Newman is a is a black uh, queer designer based in New York who's been organizing this group called Design to Divest, um, and and that model has been extremely uh, amazing. So to say that there's like this work that we can do, especially as non-black people of color and and non and, and white people, like you know, where do you have access? Where do you have um, have a voice or a platform where like Black organizers, Black Lives Matter organizers don't have to reinvent the wheel just to like get in there to say what needs to be said. You know, is there is there like a through line that we have? Um, and then how do we use that and make a lot of noise and and also be strategic? So I I, I, know, I recognize that I'm saying this and you're flipping through these slides and like these are paintings I actually haven't worked on um, <laughs> in in like about a month. You know, um, but to talk a little bit about them. Um, and, 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 and while we're on this side, I'll, I'll say, you know, for, towards that design work, you know, like a lot of the architecture work that I do for myself personally is about this like speculative, like imagining a future, uh, imagining futures where, um, where we're, you know, either like understanding what uh, a, ho a home or, or what I uh, affectionately call an elsewhere, a place where like things go away to. Um, so like a freeway or a landfill or a, or like a swamp or, you know, like a, a, a wilderness, you know, um, where all of these things can exist in, in a different way than they do now. And then connecting that to the object, the still lives that we um, <laughs> blaze through and I'm making Lexi work so hard right now, <laughs> going back and forth, that there's also, you know, some, uh, I've been thinking about all of these objects and the reason why I painted them um, is because they all in some way or another are sort of like a deferred statement from another person to the person who's now seeing it. So the safety cones are always sort of to me saying like pay attention or like attention, but it's what makes it playful and goofy and weird <laughs> at times is because the statement sometimes doesn't apply anymore or it's like confusing like what you're supposed to pay attention to or like I'm driving down the freeway and I see like 10 incredible cones and I, now I'm actually distracted instead of paying attention to the road. The chair is, you know, sort of a deferred statement of like, you know, you're welcome here or or sit, sit please or, you know, come here, you know, or or someone was here, right? Um, it, it like indicates like a body or an absence. 
you know, and so on and so forth. You know, like a lot of my work is about like othering and belonging as I think a lot of queer artists in col of color have shared that. Um, and I think, um, I guess the other thing I'll say is like, you know, yeah, in my time working from home and which is when I started painting these particular works about like a month, two months ago, um, a lot of it was, uh, yeah, asking myself, like, what are the ways that I'm seeing something, you know, as like, that, that actually would contribute something that hasn't then been portrayed before in that way. And I think, you know, artists are always asking ourselves these questions, but it becomes especially important now to, you know, to, to ask that, do that work ourselves, like in our home. So, you know, working from home, like, it's important to do that by ourselves or and with our like with our close community so that we can be uh, again even more effective in in the public sphere yeah and for me one of the reasons i was so excited to have a conversation with you today is the ways in which your design practice or architecture practice and painting practice and activist practice kind of all infiltrate one another and buttress and lift them up because for me thinking about the elsewhere the other place how do you imagine somewhere else and how that is so connected to kind of seeing objects anew. So all of these objects that we're seeing here are kind of like everyday objects, although maybe the phone booth we don't see as much as we used to, <laughs> but um, seeing them kind of panel by panel taken kind of out of their original context in this way makes maybe you think about your relationship with these objects differently. And I think for me at least that feels like an integral part of how to imagine some place or a physical reality that is not exactly the same as the present. And that feels so pertinent, especially now in the midst of this global pandemic where many, many individuals are thinking about kind of what the quote unquote new normal will be or will look like. Um, and obviously it's in process and continual, just like kind of a queerness is not yet here. Um, but there's a way in which these objects and of course the people too are, are present. And for me, the kind of transformation that happens or that translation that we were talking about earlier is such an important and key part to this idea of imagining a future that looks different and functions differently than the space that we're currently in. So I think we're um, wrapping up in terms of time, but maybe just as a way of concluding, and I think we've already talked about this so much, but just if you wanted to speak a bit about kind of what continue, keeps you driving to do this work, um, to make the paintings, to do the designing, um, and maybe excitements about different ways of being in the future or showing these works in person or not. And I'll just show, I know I haven't shown this, these earlier still lifes um, here. So I'll just put those up, but talk about kind of whatever you want. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I get, I get questions about like why the objects and, and that, you know, to the point that I even put it in the bio that you read earlier, just like extreme attachment to certain objects. Um, and it has to do with like, you know, the domestic and how it relates to the planetary, you know, so that all of these like things that are so banal and quotidian, you know, actually link us to each other and, and the planet and, you know, um, and all these systems. Um, I also like become attached to these objects um, because of the layers of cultural meaning. And I think that comes back to like being, um, being like a queer person of color, but also like being really invested in like queer communities and communities of color and, and femme communities, you know, just I, the older I get and the more I'm able to like work on my own stuff and, you know, and, and, and be, uh, um, have more language for our experiences, the more I am just so blown away and astounded by <laughs> the, the incredible range and um, knowledge and, you know, experience knowledge, embodied knowledge, ancestral knowledge, and all of the skills that, like, queer people, people of color, um, femme people have, and, um, and, I th and I think that that also becomes, like, what I'm highlighting, and even using the objects to highlight, definitely in the portraiture, definitely, you know, because it's a little more obvious in some of the other work, but in the objects as well, that there's, like, um, kind of, like, subtle, subversive, like, uh, expressions or comments that they're or like attitudes that they're having and, and it for me it becomes about this like these in uh, inherited and uh, learned uh, skills of like passing and um, and paying attention and just being really observant 
um, that a lot of us share coming from different experiences, but ultimately sharing, you know, these, these skills that I, I really, you know, really love highlighting them as skills, you know, so like passing, you know, and deciding what, you know, uh, um, can be so, uh, such a celebrated thing, even though it comes from a place of, of extreme violence, you know, to, to queer bodies. Um, and, you know, and, and what isn't said or what is like misaligned or mistranslated um, because our cultures are, um, are, are too rich and too big to be fully understood by, you know, by like in a Western context, potentially, for instance. Um, so like this painting, for instance, is, uh, is drawn from all of the objects that I I'm, have sort of like reconstructed a memory of from my, from photos of my parents wedding after they uh, came to the US and were unable to go back to China because of the Tiananmen Square massacre. So like the layer, you know, just that's, I could say more, but you know, just with that, it starts to become like, oh, there's all these layers. And I think, you know, anyone can sort of probably have, so has already made that connection with the, the, the painterly techniques of dripping and dissolving also have to do with those kinds of uh, reconstructions. So. Yeah, and I mean, fracture is something we didn't really get into in detail today, but I know there's so much that we could say and talk about and we'll continue to have these conversations, but also hopefully we'll be able to continue while we have the exhibition at the archive at some time in the future and we can see these paintings in person and talk more kind of about the layers and what we see and how those all interact. But for now, I just really want to thank you for having this conversation and really ongoing dialogue with me, which I know will continue and I'm really excited about that and excited to see what other paintings and other works and designs and actions you do before um, we're able to meet at the archive. But for now, thank you, really. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody for tuning in.